I'm Adrian Pedersen. Today on Upfront. Battleground Wisconsin, the race for U.S. Senate and Wisconsin governor set to dominate a busy 2022. This was not an easy decision for me at all. Wisconsin, I'm in. Will Senator Ron Johnson run again? How tough will re-election be for Governor Tony Evers? And what will come of the ongoing Republican-led review of the 2020 election? Our panel is standing by for a special New Year's edition of Upfront. Taking on the issues important to Wisconsin. This is Upfront with your host, Adrian Pedersen. Hello and Happy New Year. What a year it will be. 2022 is poised to be a wild one in Wisconsin politics. The midterm elections will bring two critical statewide races to Wisconsin, the race for U.S. Senate and governor. There are still a lot of unknowns about how all of this will play out. Today, we've assembled a panel to set the table for the year ahead. Our Matt Smith, J.R. Ross of WIS Politics, and A.J. Bayapur from WKOW-TV in Madison are all standing by for us. We'll begin with the race for U.S. Senate and whether Republican Senator Ron Johnson will seek re-election. He talked with Matt just before the holiday. Have you made a decision yet on whether you're going to run for re-election? I haven't, but I'm talking to all the people that I need to talk to in order to make that decision. Would this be your toughest re-election, your toughest race, you think? Not necessarily. Uh, I thought I'd done everybody a favor by just delaying this process. Uh, these campaigns are way too long. They spend way too much money. So this is not an easy decision for me at all. I, 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 you know, I, have, I have a hard time just walking away from this mess. But at the same time, a, a campaign, I, can, I just know, is, is not going to be you know, very pleasant. It's going to be vicious. Okay, hearing from Senator Johnson there. Matt, what was your biggest takeaway from that interview? So Senator Johnson said what he's said for a while now, that this decision is coming in a couple of weeks. Republicans I've talked with in the last couple of weeks say, yeah, we think he's going to run. The indications are we think he will run, but they always do it with a big caveat, saying we believe him when he says he hasn't totally made up his mind and that he may switch his mind. So this decision looming, Republicans think he's going to run, but they all know that Senator Johnson is not your average politician and will make the decision when he wants to make the decision. So there are a lot of Republicans just sitting and waiting for his final word on this, Adrian. Right. And of course, a decision really has to be made soon. And Jr., I know you've done a lot of reporting. What are insiders saying about Senator Johnson? Well, as of a few weeks ago, Ron Johnson began the process of interviewing uh, consultants and campaign managers for a possible bid. Now, even as I reported that, I was cautioned by several Republicans that he's moving toward a bid. But until it comes out of his mouth, we're not fully vested saying he's going to run for sure. Um, the way Ron Johnson's folks have couched it is that Ron Johnson hates Washington, D.C. They also hate what happened in the country. So which does he hate more? At the same time, let's not kid ourselves. Ron Johnson likes to be a U.S. senator. He gets a lot of attention for the things that he says. He raises questions about COVID-19 vaccines or how the country's approached the pandemic. He gets attention because he's a U.S. senator. If he's not going to run again, that attention goes away. So he knows he has this uh, soapbox for his views because of his position he's in. Plus, being the most vulnerable U.S. senator in the country, or one of them, amplifies the attention because here's a guy saying things are controversial, even though he could be up for election next year um, and could pay a price for those things. Jer, who are you hearing do you think would be Senator Johnson's biggest competition on the Democratic side? Well, it's interesting. When I talk to people who are backing Sarah Galuski, they claim it's a two-person race for Democratic nomination between Sarah and Mandela Barnes. But I talked to people backing Alex Lazary. They say it's a two-person race between Alex Lazary and Mandela Barnes. So that tells me one thing. Barnes is the front runner for the nomination. The question is, can somebody catch him and take it away from him? It's really kind of those three, the top tier. Uh, Tom Nelson's trying to uh, elbow his way up there and make a name for himself as like this Feingold-esque candidate who's going to rise above the fray at some point. But Barnes has got better name ID than anybody else right now. Um, he did a pretty decent job fundraising from other donors. Lazary and Galuski both put their own money in. We haven't seen a whole lot of polling in that primary, but we have seen tell us Mandela's out in front. The question is, can anybody catch him? And will he slip up in some way that allow an open somebody else to come come catch him? AJ, what are, what are you hearing in Madison? I mean, you're there every day out on the streets. You go to the Capitol. What are your thoughts? Well, certainly, uh, as you know, Madison is perhaps, in fact, not even perhaps, it's the most progressive city in the state. So a lot of the folks in Madison, they tend to support the very progressive candidate, Mandela Barnes. The question from some folks within the Democratic Party who I talk to wonder how that will play in a general election, because 
you wonder with some of the things Senator Johnson has said, whether you go back to one year ago with some of his comments on the January 6th riots at the Capitol to what he said about the COVID-19 vaccine throughout much of 2021. Are there going to be, you've heard of the never Trump Republicans, are there some never Ron conservatives out there who believe that he's gone too far, but would they be able to pull the trigger and vote for a Democrat if that Democratic candidate is someone as progressive as Lieutenant Governor Barnes has been. So that's a question that I'm hearing from some folks in the Democratic Party when I'm having those conversations. The question is, if Barnes maintains this early advantage he has in the primary, if he ends up being the candidate, will he appeal to enough moderate voters? Or on the flip side, would he be able to generate enough enthusiasm in Madison and Milwaukee to generate Democratic turnout to offset any moderate voters who might vote for a Lazary, Godlewski, or even a Tom Nelson, but wouldn't necessarily be comfortable voting for Mr. Barnes? Okay, and I want to continue a little bit because Senator Johnson has also recently suggested that the Wisconsin legislature take control of federal elections. And with that, let's talk about the ongoing GOP review of the 2020 presidential election led by former Supreme Court Justice Michael Gableman. Gableman recently addressed a crowd of Republicans in Chippewa County. The county GOP posted that talk on its Facebook page. Now that I'm getting a much better picture of how systemic and how broad and how wide the problem is, I, and quite frankly, what I really need, what I really need to do it right. I please don't be surprised if you read that I have asked Speaker Voss for a revised budget. AJ, I know you talked to Speaker Voss recently. He's the one who hired Gableman. He initially wanted this to be done in October or November, but now Gableman saying he needs more money, more time. Any indication of how long this will last? Well, what we've gathered in our conversation with Speaker Voss is, yes, this is going to go longer and may very well cost more than was originally budgeted and set on a timeline. For Speaker Voss, he blames Democrats. He points to the lawsuit filed by Attorney General Josh Call, saying, well, if the Democrats weren't taking this to court, we could be done with this. Of course, their response is, well, we have to go to court because we will not abide by a private interview with Mr. Gableman or his team. What's interesting is talking to some other Republicans, they're not quite going as far as Speaker Voss, who defends the idea of having these conversations happen in private. Uh, majority Leader in the Assembly, Jim Steinecke, when we asked him about that, he said, well, we've taken a hands-off approach to the Gableman investigation. If that's how he wants to do it, we're trusting him to do it that way. But other Republicans, including Representative Kurtz, have said, if the holdup here is whether these conversations should happen in public, then put a hearing on the calendar at the Capitol and let's see if these clerks and mayors would show up if we had an Assembly Elections Committee hearing at the Capitol and let's just get this done. Matt, I'm going to have you jump in on this. I know you're also doing a lot of reporting on Justice Gableman's investigation. Yeah, so the inside of this among Republicans is getting interesting. Adrian, you had State Senator Kathy Bernier uh, on the show just a couple of weeks ago when she said, hey, there are other Republicans who feel like I do that this needs to come to an end. They're not going to say so publicly, but I am getting that support. And now you see this back and forth between them. Gableman recently now saying he wants Kathy Bernier to resign, and that was met with applause in Chippewa County. So the inner workings of Republicans in these conversations is a factor that is happening behind the scenes as well, as well as this court action. We're going to see some action in that over the next couple of weeks here as that plays out as well, Adrian. JR, how do you think this investigation could impact Republicans getting elected overall? Well, there are a couple of things. One, uh, Republicans I talk to tell me on a regular basis they go back to the district and do an event you know, with the county party or the grassroots. And they will get beat up because they're not doing enough to quote unquote stop the steal or from the results or do something to put Donald Trump back in office. And they try to explain to them, well, we passed these bills, Governor Beavers vetoed them. We're doing all we can right now with a Democrat in the East Wing. They tell me that'll placate folks, but then they'll see something on Facebook or a social media post and they'll be on, again, like on the warpath about you guys aren't doing enough. And what it underscores is that there's a segment of the Republican base that is not going to be happy with whatever Gableman produces unless it leads to criminal charges or reverse results of the 2020 election in Wisconsin. Well, on the latter point, we know that can't happen. The votes have been cast, Electoral College, that's done, signed, sealed, delivered. Uh, the Racine County Sheriff recommended charges uh, against five of the six election commissioners. It's been several months since that recommendation came down. We've heard nothing from the DA in Racine County. So there are folks who aren't going to be happy in the Republican base. The question is, when are they disappointed? Is it going to be in January, February, March, April, May? The closer we get to the election, the more it could hurt Republican turnout. 
if those guys are, are unhappy about the results. Now, the flip side is, for Democrats, the more they see what's going on and going, this is not a legitimate investigation, you know, Gablin's hired all these people who have either ties to Trump or are conspiracy theorists, they're going to say, I-, I might be motivated by this, maybe they turn out, there all kinds of like unknowns. And the question is, when's that final report come out? And is there enough time to digest it and kind of get back to balance by November? Right. We'll see what happens in the next few months. Okay. Matt, JR, and AJ, please stand by for us. Our panel discussion is just getting started. Up next, another big race, the race for governor. Will Governor Tony Evers keep his job? And will any more Republicans get in the race?